good afternoon to all of you, God's chosen people. Uh, God, thanking God for his mercy and his grace for allowing all of us here on this beautiful day this afternoon uh, to uh, worship together in prayer and the word of God. Amen. It didn't look like things were going to be as be good. It didn't look like we were going to be able to make it. Uh, as we uh, you all know, Florida had the real bad um, storm that came through. Um, uh, asking for prayers for all of those on uh, the west coast of Florida, especially the Tampa area, Sarasota area, and areas just north of that of those areas. So we want to pray for all of them. Um, they got hit really hard. There are parts of uh, Tampa that I used to live and frequent when I was stationed there. Fowler Avenue is completely underwater. Uh, areas near uh, University of Southern Florida are still underwater. Uh, there are areas, uh, Temple Terrace, other areas that were affected, not, maybe not by the flooding, but many areas uh, on that side were affected by the tornadoes. Uh, homes were destroyed. I think 17 people were killed because of um, tornadoes. On this side, we had flooding in Orlando. Uh, we had a few houses um, destroyed. There were tornadoes on this side as well. Also, there's a little bit of a surge from the east coast as the um, the hurricane left the eastern coast. It still pushed water up on the eastern coast. So, uh, and here where I live in uh, Kissimmee, uh, the eye of the storm did pass by this area. We did get hit with part of the uh, eye. Winds of up to 75 to 80 miles an hour here blew completely pulled one of our bushes out of the ground. Me and my boys had to get rid of it yesterday. So there was a lot of bad things, a lot of devastation, but I will say this, even through the storm, the Lord uh, kept everyone. No loss of life in this neighborhood. There are many are still standing. Many are still able to breathe. Many are still able to survive. Uh, our prayers go to those who lost loved ones. Amen. We did lose Quite a bit of people through both hurricanes and not only that but uh, although we got it here um, we did have some damages here let's pray for those who got the most damage in tampa through helene and milton but also through for those who got damage in north carolina georgia and tennessee they as well as alabama as well uh, let's pray for all of those because they are still fighting to get the help that they need. They're still uh, dealing with the devastation. Some people's homes that survived the storms are now floating, falling into the, the creeks and the rivers and being destroyed still to this day. I still have not gotten help. Uh, many are still up in the mountains with no help and no support, stuck trying to find water to be able to survive, to cook and to eat with. So. Um, there's still a lot to be done, and I pray um, that we all pray for them and uh, give them support morally and spiritually, but also, uh, if we can, monetarily to give them the help that they need. Amen. Amen. God bless. Um, I do want to talk about something. I'm talking to my boys this morning, and I asked them a question. The question I asked is, is who right now is giving the best messaging or the strongest messaging in this world? The church or the world and its entities and their answer was the world and its entities and they were right why are you saying that preacher well I'm saying that because what I'm noticing is is that the message of the church is being diluted by the world the message of the church is being corrupted by those of the world we're putting uh, political correctness in God's house we're putting um, stops and blocks on preaching and giving the word of God which is not right if our children can be exposed to different things within the LGBTQ or whatever they are community if our children can be exposed to sexually explicit mess through their through YouTube and through their cartoons and things like that then why is the church stopped or blocked from exposing children and others to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, it's because of because it it basically goes against everything that they believe and everything that they push. 
the messaging of the church in itself has been diluted because many have allowed themselves to be bought by the world. To be bought meaning to have notoriety, to have their name etched on here and to be seen through governmental eyes as an ally and all this stuff and forgetting that Christ can care. He cared nothing about that. The message of Christ was himself. He spoke, he taught, he preached, and he healed the sick and raised the dead. And then ultimately his mission to die on the cross. He spoke and preached and taught his disciples, taught them, gave them the mission to carry on his mission to save everyone. Jesus said in, in John 10 and 16, other sheep I have, meaning those that were not part of Israel or Jews. And then um, Paul, in the book of Acts, Christ knocked him off his beast and he had to converge and the Lord told him, I'm sending you to the Gentiles. The mission of Christ still is here. The problem is we're not fulfilling the mission, number one. And number two, our messaging about Christ is not pure. The study of the Word of God is very, very simple and it's not hard. You just need to pick it up, pray first, have faith, and then pick it up and study. It's that simple. It's not hard. Yes, every now and then you may have to get books like the behind me I have that give you that the help sometimes paint the picture that much more vivid so you can understand what the scripture is saying but by doing that it helps with your messaging and it helps with what you're saying in order to draw those who need to be drawn to Christ the problem is is that we go off on our own opinion what we think and how we feel I told my sons earlier, I said, a lot of times when we get into our feels and our opinions and what we think, that's when Satan gets us. And that's the problem. That's why preachers are having conflicts with what the scripture says and how they feel. Because Satan is the one confusing them. Well, I feel this, 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 this. I know what the scripture says, but I feel, no, sorry. I, if you're in a church and the pastor or a preacher gets up and says, my opinion of this scripture, you need to leave. If he gets up and says, I feel, leave. Because none of it, what you feel and what your opinion is important when it comes to the gospel. God cares less about any of it. Plain and simple. The stumbling blocks of the church. The two main stumbling blocks of the church are, well, three. All right, number one, the study of the gospel. Two, money. Three, racial stupidity. Those are the top three. The study of the gospel. We're not studying efficiency efficiently enough to understand the gospel for what it is and not for what we want it to be. Two, money. We have, we have turned the church into a money-making enterprise. We have focused on people attaining riches and things instead of attaining eternal life. Thirdly, racial stupidity. So many people have painted themselves into racial corners. We've used race, we've used politics as weapons against other churches, against other pastors, heck, even against our own self within each local body. Our messaging is not right and our messaging is diluted. It's time for the church to get out of its fields, get out of its opinion, and get out of what it thinks and start taking the word of God for what it is and what it has always been. The Lord is doing a new thing. No, he's not, because the scripture says, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I do not change. The Lord makes that very clear. So when someone you hear someone say that, you need to leave. God is not doing anything new. The word of God has not changed, nor will it ever change, because this is who God is in word. John makes that very clear in John 1 when he says, In the beginning was the word. Huh? 
and the word was with God and the word was God. Same in the beginning. He is the same now. We got to stop. Scripture also says that judgment starts in the church. There's also a scripture says that the very elect will be fooled as well. Right now, they're being fooled. Heck, at one point, I almost was fooled until the Lord opened my eyes through the gospel. We got to get out of this mess before we end up in a pit that we cannot get ourselves out of. Not every pastor is called. Not every preacher is called. We have, we have gotten out of our roles that God has given us and decided to take on roles that God has not called us to do. Nobody wants to preach 1 Timothy 2. Nope. Nobody wants to preach 2 Timothy the 3rd chapter, the 16th and the 17th verse. Nobody wants to preach 2 Timothy 4. Nobody wants to preach Romans 1. Because Why? It basically takes a hammer to everything, every false notion, every feeling, and every opinion we have on popular stuff. It destroys all of it. And we don't preach it because we don't want to destroy it because we want to keep our mess going and we want to keep this bad messaging out there instead of doing the work of Christ. Time to stop. Time to turn off the radio. Throw it in the trash and start picking up the word of God. Start turning up the volume, which is the voice of Christ. And through the power of the Holy Spirit that can guide us through our study and guide us through our preaching and teaching of the gospel. God bless you. May the Lord keep you is our prayer. We have to change our message. Amen. Amen. I promise I won't be before you alone this morning. Um. We're going to go through our opening scripture. Our opening scripture, we're coming out of the book of John 5. Uh, I'm just going to read the 10th through the 16th verses. Quick seven verses of our opening scripture. That is John, the Apostle John. The book or gospel according to John. Uh, the 5th chapter, verse 10 through 16. John 5, verse 10 through 16. I'm going to read out of the King James Version this morning. A tenth verse read by saying, The Jews therefore said unto him that that was cured. It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then, then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed was not who it was, but Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. I read for you hearing the book of John, the fifth chapter, or the gospel according to John, uh, the fifth chapter, the tenth through the sixteenth verses. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his holy and righteous word. Uh, the Lord is leading me in a different direction. Let's go to prayer. Let's go into prayer. Our Father and our God, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord God, for all that you have done. Lord, we thank you for bringing all through the storm, all those who survive. Lord God, although we may be down uh, personal belongings, that we may have lost a home or vehicle, Lord, we are still alive. You have spared us for a reason. And we pray, Lord God, that you will provide and help Lord God, everyone that is affected by both storms, by Helene and by Milton. Realizing, Lord God, we know that the recovery is going to take years. It's going to take months. We know, Lord God, that many are going to have to start over again. But, Lord God, we ask you, Lord God, to be in the midst, Lord God, to help them, to help those who don't know you that have survived, 
to, to see you, to realize that they need you in their life. Realizing, Lord God, we all need you, Lord God. Sometimes storms that come into our lives spiritually, Lord God, sometimes they come in and they wreak havoc. But Lord God, we know that you are with us through the storms, Lord God, and you're with us after the storms pass. And we pray, Lord God, that after, now that this storm has passed, we ask you, Lord God, to stay with those who are suffering, Lord God, through losses of family. Lord God, there were whole families that were wiped away. There were wives, daughters, sons, Lord God, husbands, brothers, sisters, all wiped away and washed away through the floods and through the storms and through the tornadoes. And Lord God, I ask you, Lord God, to bless and touch those families. Give them the comfort they need right now in the name of Jesus. Asking, Lord God, to fill those gaps that are left, Lord God, with comfort, with love, Lord God, that they may be able to stand up, recover, and be stronger than they were before. Bless your message this morning that it, that it may go out. Touch your messenger, Lord God, that I may preach a word according to what your scriptures say, that it is sound, and that the ears may hear, and the hearts and minds may understand and may be changed. According to your power, and the power of your Holy Spirit. These are all the blessings we ask for your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I said before y'all, I'm not going to be before you long. Uh, this, this afternoon, we're going to come out of the book of John again. Gospel according to John. The 8th chapter. And I'm only going to read um, verse 7 through 11. Um, the message will encompass verse... 1 through 11, but I'm going to read verse 7 through 11. That is John, the 8th chapter. We're going to begin at verse 7. We're going to read all the way down to verse 11, those five verses. Again, the gospel according to John, the 8th chapter, verse 7 through 11, out of the King James Version. The seventh verse reads by saying, So when they continued asking him, he lifted up, him, up himself, excuse me, and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst or in the middle. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw no, none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Amen. Amen. This morning, I just want to talk to you just for a few minutes from the subject Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. The writer of this gospel is, as I said before, is the Apostle John, the brother of James. John, that beloved disciple. John, the son of Zebedee. John, who was part of the inner circle along with Peter and his brother James. Also, John, this apostle, the apostle, who also authored uh, the epistles of John and the book of Revelations. John's gospel is different from the other gospels because his gospel is particular in his explanation of who Christ is. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke give a similar look into the life of Christ because of this fact. Many theologians call these writers synoptic Gospels. In other words, all of these Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all give similar accounts of the life of Christ, all except John. These writings are called synoptic, go synoptic Gospels are because they all describe events from a similar point of view as contrasted with that of John's gospel. John himself starts at the beginning in John 1 and 1 by saying, In the beginning was the Word, 
referencing the book of Genesis. The theme of this book is Christ in his deity. John shows and proves Christ as the son of God and a part of the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. For he says in John 1 and 2, the same was in the beginning with God. In Genesis 1 and 26, Moses writes and proves John's point when he says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Of course, the, 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 the two key words in that statement is us and our, showing that Christ, along with the Holy Spirit, was at the beginning with God. Throughout this gospel, John shows the unmistakable and remarkable God wrapped in flesh, that is, Jesus Christ, through his interaction with the disciples, the Jews, and the Jewish leaders. John never names himself as the author of this gospel. He only reveals himself as the beloved disciple. The place and time of writing is after the, the, the destruction of the temple in AD 70, where he wrote this particular book from Ephesus, which was his resident home. In the beginning of this chapter, we see Christ had left the temple after the Feast of Tabernacles and made his way to the Mount of Olives. The next day, Jesus returns to the temple where the people came to hear him and he started teaching. Now at this point, many in the temple recognized Jesus as the man who proclaimed himself as the living water in the previous chapter on the last day of the feast. Here, many of the people that were there return now to hear more from Christ. Hmm. This is a good example for all preachers pastors to speak the truth no matter the situation christ in the middle of the feast speaks the truth that he was the living water now christ knew there was a possibility that he would be attacked or someone would try to grab him but yet it did not stop him from speaking the truth hmm. paul tells us in timothy in second timothy excuse me four and two Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Speaking the truth doesn't have a season. We should speak the truth at all times. Preaching and proclaiming the gospel truth may not gain many friends. No, it ain't. But it can gain souls for the kingdom of God. In our text, we see people coming to Jesus as he begins to teach in the temple again. Verse 3 and 4 of the 8th chapter says, And the scribes and Pharisees, listen to this, And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman caught, key word in this, caught in adultery. When they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was caught, again, that key word, caught in adultery in the very act. This on the surface seems logical, but what was their purpose? Why did they have to bring her before Christ? What was the ulterior motive? Hmm. What were they hoping? to achieve by doing this and by bringing her and doing this in front of Jesus and others. Well, it seems their purpose wasn't truly, wasn't to truly judge the woman per se, but to stop Jesus and to show that he truly wasn't who he proclaimed he was or who he is. It seems after the feast, the religious leaders still had to test Jesus on his authority and his power. 
they forgot that according to the law, listen to this. If she was caught in adultery, not only was she to be arrested or grabbed, then the man also that was caught with her was to also be brought in, judged, as well as stoned. In other words, both caught in the sin were to be stoned according to the law. Wycliffe explains it this way. Angered at Jesus' success and frustrated by their inability to get rid of him, talking about the religious leaders, these leaders now seized on an opportunity to embarrass him before the people. They embarrassed the woman too by placing her in the middle of it or in the midst of this. The religious leaders wanted to trap my Lord any way they could. According to the law, adultery was an offense punishable by stoning or death. The dilemma was, if Jesus sided with the law, he would be lambasted as a heartless, unmerciful man. Or if he allowed her to be saved from her fate, he would be blasted as too weak and in no way the son of God. See, this is how Satan tried to test Jesus in the wilderness. Satan was calculated in his approach to Jesus. In other words, he had a plan. Just as the religious leaders are here, they had a plan. They had a plan to try to stump the chump, as we call it. We who are followers, listen to this, we who are followers must be aware of the enemy's attempts and his tactics to snare and to trap us. Satan and the world are cunning in their attempts. But the question is, can we fight against their attempts? It's a very good question. So many Christians have caved to the world's demands and allowed the world to influence their preaching and teaching of the gospel, as I said in the beginning. It has gotten so bad that pastors are marrying couples of the same gender and are allowing and committing acts against the word of God. We have allowed the world to practically take over the church. The church in which Jesus founded in the book of Matthew, the 16th chapter. He says in that 18th verse, Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not and shall not prevail against it. Doesn't mean that hell won't get into church. Doesn't mean the church won't have any problems. But Satan and those who bring the hell in won't win. And the only way they won't win is that those who know the word of God can fight against them. Block them out. Kick them out. So that the church can heal and be strengthened by the word of God through Jesus Christ. So the religious leaders are before the Lord trying to stump the Lord with this particular case. Notice in the sixth verse of our text, it seems Jesus didn't pay any attention to any of them. The last part of that verse says, but Jesus stooped down. And with his finger, wrote on the ground. And I love the last part of that verse. It says, as though he hurt them not. In other words, he ignored them. <laughs> Many would say, why would Jesus ignore these people? These are the religious leaders. Why would he ignore them? Let's keep going. Jesus knew. And knowing their ultimate reasoning for this, just ignores them and writes on the ground. Of course, the Pharisees being impatient and not enjoying being ignored continue to bug Jesus. Listen, look, look at this. Isn't that funny? Whenever those who don't like you, when you don't give them any attention, give them any space, they always keep going to keep trying to needle you, try to mess with you. And yet, if you're not unfazed, 
it seems to irritate them that much more. Their insistence, listen to this, their insistence on Jesus here shows their childish behavior and evil hearts toward the Lord. God, I mean, Jesus, God wrapped in flesh, the Lord, knew what they were doing. He knew their plan. He understood what they were trying to do. Hmm. Their priorities were definitely not in the right place. They disturbed Jesus. Listen to this. They disturbed Jesus from teaching, which was what they should have been doing in the temple themselves being the religious leaders. Instead of trying to attack and to put a stumbling block in the way of the Lord Jesus. Their lack of leadership and care for the people only fueled their lust for power and their hate for Christ that much more. The religious leaders were very astute in the law of Moses. Yes, they were, but they failed. They failed to let that same law lead them to the Messiah who was able to save them from the penalty of the law. Listen to this again. They were very astute, knowledgeable of the law. They knew the law like the back of their hand. They wore it on their, their wardrobe. They wore it on their head. They wore it on their, their garb. And they, they, they supposedly emanated the law all around, but yet the very person in front of them that they were trying to stump was the only one that could save them from the penalty of the law. For the Bible says, for the wages of sin is what? Death. Anybody that broke the law was what? Going to die. This was the situation this woman was in right now. She broke the law and her penance or her payment was death. But I love the other part of that verse. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life. And the very person that could give them that gift was right there in front of them. Their arrogance. And their refusal to accept Jesus as the Son of God and the Messiah only puts them further away from God. So, let's keep going. So, with their insisting, in other words, they're, they're bugging him. They're basically needling him. Jesus says, all right, I'm going to make a decision. Jesus comes with an answer and a lesson. All in one statement. Verse 7 says, So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto him, He that is without sin among you. Key words. Key phrase. He that is without sin among you. Not the woman. Them. The accusers. Let him first cast a stone at her. I love how Jesus shuts them up without raising his voice or causing a ruckus. He simply states the truth. If any of you have no sin, then throw the first stone at her. This is the epitome of what Jesus talks about I believe it's in Matthew where he talks about the, how we are not to judge one another. How can you sit there and talk about the moat in your brother's eye when you have a beam in your own eye? Hmm. What Jesus is conveying here is that nobody is without sin except him. For Christ knew no sin. Hmm. Even the religious leaders acknowledged they themselves had sin. How did they do that, preacher? How did they do that? How did they acknowledge they had sinned in this situation? Well, they acknowledged by none of them throwing a stone at the woman. <laughs> Remember, they told Jesus they caught, that key word again, her in the very act of adultery. The 
question here, Jesus said in so many words was, you sinned because you watched. Why were you watching? Why were you looking? Why didn't you stop the act, correct them, and send them on their way? Jesus is saying, you were watching, you're just as guilty as those that were in the middle of the act. You were watching. Through one statement, Jesus shows the hypocrisy of the religious leaders and calmly convicts them with a simple statement, with simple truth, because it was. None of them could throw a stone at her because by rights, they deserved themselves to be stoned. Hmm. Verse 9 says, and they who heard it being convicted by their own conscience. I love that. It says, being convicted, found guilty by what they did by their own conscience. Went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Powerful statement Jesus made. Made them think. The Lord showed them their stupidity without speaking a lot of words. Hmm. Notice that they left from the oldest to the youngest. Why is that? Many people don't talk about that part. Why did they leave from the oldest to the youngest? Well, the older men in the situation showed themselves to be bad examples for the younger men. They led those young men to sin while trying to execute a woman for hers. Two wrongs don't make a don't make a right. Hmm. So now that the accusers have left, Jesus looks up at the woman and asks her, Woman, where are those nine accusers? Had no man condemned thee? At this point, Jesus notices the male accusers have left. This verse shows that their attempt of trying to test Jesus had ultimately failed. They had no case. They had nothing. Despite this silly situation, the religious leaders never stopped their attempt to disprove Jesus or to prove that he was a fake. They still were relentless in their pursuit. In the fifth chapter I just read, they were they were relentless to the point that they wanted to kill and stone Jesus. Hmm. Even at times trying, like I said, to stone him, they, they did. A couple of cases, they tried to take out Jesus with, with, with rocks themselves. In this text, though, we also see how hate can cause us to do sinful things, to try and to set a trap for others. Oh, there are many that do that. Because we don't like them, we do all we can to try to take them out. See, while Jesus preached love, they showed hate. Talking about the religious leaders. While Jesus sat and ate with sinners, they despised them all. While Jesus healed and delivered, they murmured amongst themselves, separating themselves from the people. How have, or have we, excuse me, have we as God's people gotten to the point that we have separated ourselves from the very souls that we seek out? In other words, have we gotten so bad in the church that we have separated ourselves from the very people we need to reach? Sadly, that answer is yes. Is yes. We should be like Jesus and go to where they are and give them the word. Sit and have a bite to eat with them and then give them the bread of life sit and have a beverage with them and then introduce them to the living water. But right now, attaining positions in the church is more important. Attaining the name and the title means more than attaining souls for Christ. We must understand that none of that mess in the church of attaining titles and attaining positions is not the mission. Seeking the lost is. But Jesus says, in Luke 15, 4 through 7, what man of you having 100 sheep, if he loses one of them, doth not leave the 90 and 9 in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he finds it? And when he hath found it, 
he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner, over one sinner, excuse me, that repenteth. More than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Our job is not in the church building, is outside in the community, in the streets, reaching the lost. Period. Christ is giving us the example throughout the Gospels. The apostles through Acts and through the writings of Paul and through Hebrews, the, the, these scriptures and also through all of the epistles in the book of Revelations, all of these examples show that our mission is in the communities to reach, preach, and teach, to baptize in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. For Jesus said that in the book of Matthew 28, 19 and 20. What are we doing? What impact are we making? Hmm. Let's keep going. Here Jesus is with the woman with no accusers. Her being scared and anticipating what might happen to her after all of the commotion stirred up by the religious leaders tells Jesus that she had no more accusers. Can you imagine being in this woman's position? Knowing that imminently she might die. These men had no mercy and no love for her. Right then she was a defendant getting ready to be sentenced to death. And yet they were just as sinful as she was. And they could not carry out the sentence because they themselves deserve the same sentence. Hmm. So Jesus says to her in the 11th verse, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Here Jesus gives in short terms the purpose of his presence on earth to save and to not condemn. Jesus could have easily gone along with the mob that accused her considering that what she did was against the law but he instead gives her mercy even through even through what let me put it this way he gives her mercy even though the law say you're supposed to be dead. Death is your sentence. And yet Jesus says, no. I'm going to give her grace. <laughs> I'm going to give her mercy. I am going to give her a chance. A chance that the law would not have given her. Amazing. Christ shows this woman such great compassion and great mercy. By him telling her to sin no more shows his forgiveness of her sin. He sought not to condemn her, but to love and show mercy to her by giving her another chance. Christ has done the same for us. He has given us his mercy and forgiveness even when we don't deserve it. Every day we live, his mercy flows and follows us. Psalms 23 and 6 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Once you are saved and are forgiven, his mercy stays with you. Forgiveness is not just something Christ has and continues to do for us, but it is sometimes we as Christians, we must do for one another. Forgive. Jesus himself teaches that no matter how many times someone sins against you, you must forgive them each time. Matthew 18, 21 through 22 says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say unto thee until seven times, but 
until 70 times 7. In other words, non-stop. Never stop. Forgive it. Forgiveness is a part of the Christian life and daily walk. So many walk around with so much animosity and grudges because of what people have done to them. Many have forgiven those who sin against them. And then some have forgiven but have not forgotten. And others seek revenge. The one thing we all forget is that forgiveness is not for the debtor. It's for us. So that again, the sin, forgiveness is not for the person who sinned against you. Forgiveness is for those who got sinned against. We must let things that are done to us go. Look at Jesus in this text. This encounter with the religious leaders was one of many where their mission was to embarrass, stone, or disapprove of Jesus' actions. I'm sure this annoyed Jesus, but he never let them get to him. Even while dying on the cross, he forgave them. Luke 24 and 34 says, Then Jesus, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Even in the midst of agony, he forgave them. If Christ in agony can forgive and die for you, why can we forgive one another? If you love each other, then you should forgive each other when we stumble. Christ didn't indict this woman. He just forgave her. The love and compassion he showed this woman is the same love and compassion we can show others. We at times judge people on their past or by how, or by how they look or just by how they dress. So many of us have become so arrogant and pompous that we fool ourselves. And forget that we were once in need of spiritual help. I remember my late pastor, Dr. Charles Alexander, used to say, In the church, we are all ex-something. Ex-liars, ex-backbiters, ex-adulterers, etc. In other words, we all once had problems that only Jesus Christ could fix. We all were lost souls that needed guidance. We all were blinded by sin and needed Christ to lift the darkness. No matter who you are, if you are saved, Christ saved you from something. Whether from drugs or drunkenness, none of us are any better than the other. Matthew 7, 1 through 5 says, Judge ye not. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with that judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with that measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? But considereth not the beam that is in your own eye. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Huh. Thou Hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thy own eye. Then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. It's time for us to realize that we must love first and never judge. We must feed the lost physically, then feed them spiritually. So now Jesus tells her in verse 11, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus here in a short statement set her free from the consequences of sin. According to the law, she was condemned to death. But Jesus stepped in and saved her life. He did the same thing for you and for me. When I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, 
very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters he lifted me. Now safe am I. The Lord's love lifted me from utter destruction. He saved my soul and told me to go and sin no more. He's calling us to show compassion. He's calling us to show love. He's calling on us to seek out those that are lost. He's calling, on, he's calling on us to preach, to teach, and to baptize. He's calling us to fulfill his mission. He's coming back to take us home. He's coming back to a church without a spot or blemish. Get your house in order. If you want to see Jesus, you must sin no more. If you want to be in paradise with Jesus, you must allow the Spirit to transform your mind. Don't allow this world to suck you back into its grasp. Instead, anchor yourself to Jesus Christ through the knowledge of the gospel. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Amen. Go and sin no more. God bless you. May the Lord keep you is our prayer. Jesus, in very short words, did so much in this situation. He did more than many of us do in a long time. By simply saying, notice, before I say the statement, notice, Jesus Christ did not argue and he did not engage them. He simply said truth in very few words. He said, the, all of you right here who are without sin, cast the first stone. No one in that group of men, the religious leaders, could throw one stone because they sinned themselves. They sinned in order to catch her in her sin and to test Jesus. And Jesus called them out for the hypocrisy. Go and sin no more. God bless you. May the Lord keep you is our prayer. Um, thank you all for joining in with us on today. Um, and always remember those that uh, that need prayer in this area, in the southern, the southeast. Amen. From Georgia to Alabama to North Carolina, to parts of South Carolina and Tennessee, as well as here in Florida. Pray for all those who are affected. Keep them in your prayers. Amen. But also pray for our churches, all of our churches, actually the body of Christ as a whole. We need to change our messaging. We need to go back to the basics of the gospel and pray that we are able to fulfill the mission that Christ has given us and to use the example of Christ, even in this particular message, not to engage those who tend, who try to tear us down, but to speak the truth and not waver from the word of God. Amen. Amen. God bless you. May the Lord keep you is our prayer. Remember, uh, to join our group here on Facebook, uh, Colorblind Fellowship Church group. I'm always posting stuff on there. I think I don't, I don't know how much I post, but I post a lot. <laughs> but I post a lot of things uh, for encouragement, uh, to encourage us in our faith. But only that, but also to encourage to exercise our faith, to go and to help and to compel others, amen, to come to Christ. Also, please uh, join in to uh, and subscribe to uh, Colorblind Fellowship Church page on YouTube. Uh, all the services and, and uh, messages will be posted on YouTube. Amen. Also, please um, uh, subscribe to us on rumble.com, Colorblind Fellowship Church page on there. Please subscribe. Uh, I think almost all of our services that have been done, uh, past and present, are also posted on rumble.com. Amen. Amen. So please subscribe. 
uh, join in with us and be blessed by the gospel. Amen. Amen. We thank all those who have supported us along the way, who have given me encouraging words. Um, Miss Catherine uh, Spinetta Dorenzo, God bless you. You always, every now and then, send me a, mess, a message of encouragement and thanks. And I'm going to send you a message of encouragement and thanks that God has kept you through the storm as well in Naples. Amen. God bless you. And may the Lord keep you, as well as others who have encouraged me and have said good things. Um, it's been This ministry has been a blessing, not only to me, but I also pray that it's been a blessing to all of you who listen and who watch. For it ain't about me. Amen. It's about the very person I preached about today. It's about Christ and what he has to say through his word. Amen. That's why our messaging is very important. And that's why it's important for us to read it, to study it. And to digest it in our souls. Amen. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father and our God, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We pray, Lord God, that the word goes out and hearts are touched, hearts are changed, and hearts seek you for guidance. Lord God, we ask you for forgiveness of all of our sins. We ask you, Lord God, to strengthen our hearts, our minds, and our souls. Lord God, to be able to fight against the devil in this crazy, mixed up world. We ask you, Lord God, to bless those that are on the prayer list. Lord God, we ask you to bless those, Lord God, that are suffering right now through the storms that have happened. But also, Lord God, we ask you to bless our government and our leadership within our government. Realizing, Lord God, we all need you. Lord God, they need you right now. We ask you, Lord God, that, Lord God, we, we just pray, Lord God, that in this time of election and all that is going on we pray lord god that you will be in the midst in other words that you would lord god just be in control in the name of jesus bless church families bless pastors bless leaders in the church help us lord god to stick to your word or god to stick through to the, to the to the words on the pages to stick to the words that you lord god that you enable your men that you have chosen to write this great book lord god that we stick to those words, that we not lean on our own understanding, that we always acknowledge you and that you would direct our path, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Help the churches and pastors and leaders to be beacons in this community, beacons for you, Lord God, that others may be drawn and be saved. Bless this ministry. Bless me, Lord God, as the leader of this ministry. Give me strength and bless this ministry that it may grow doesn't have to be a lot of numbers, Lord God, but it grows in the word of God, that it is taught, that it is preached, and that the truth is given that others may hear and be saved. These and all other blessings we ask in your son Jesus' name we pray, amen, and thank God. God bless you. May the Lord keep you is our prayer. Um, pray next uh, weekend. We will have services next Sunday afternoon at, at noon. Keep your ears out and keep your eyes out for any updates this week. I'll let you know if anything changes between now and then. But as for now, we will see you, Lord's willing, if God allows. Next Sunday, same time, same place. Sunday afternoon, fellowship at, tw at 12 noon. May God bless you this week and may God keep you as our children go back to school and as many of us go back to work. I love you all and there's nothing you can do about it. I'll see you next Sunday, Lord's willing.